Hello, this is Myra Elaine on the Buying Space channel. I'm doing to the adult Bible studies today, Encounters in Prayer and Love for Spring 2024. Uh, the lesson today is about the woman who had a daughter who was demon-possessed. And as always, I don't read the direct uh, lesson in the Bible study. I leave that to uh, the Methodist Sunday School teachers across the nation and probably across the world. I don't know how widespread this publication is. But um, I also don't read other gospel passages and I avoid passages that I read in my other uh, Bible studies. So today I'm going to make the selection to read Amos 9. Now, the verse range is 7 to 12. I'm going to go to 15. I'm going to read 7 to 15. I might decide to start before 7. But anyway, here's the book of Amos. And the chapter starts off. Well, I'll just read verse 1 to you. The words of Amos, who was among sheep bearers of Toga, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzzah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, and Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. I'd love to know what year that earthquake was. There's probably evidence of that earthquake. Wouldn't that be neat? Now, it starts off with hellfire and damnation. And uh, the transgressors are Damascus, Gaza, Edom, which the, those are the uh, descendants of Esau, Ammon or Ammonites, um, which are the descendants of Lot, Moab, which another group of descendants of Lot, uh, that was the two daughters of Lot that slept with him uh, to have babies because uh, since they were came out of Sodom and Gomorrah when it was destroyed, people looked at them as cursed. So no one would uh, marry his daughter. So they got him drunk, slept with him, and had babies. And uh, Ammon and Moab were their sons and then they built nations from there uh, Judah Israel okay, and then it starts talking about what order the uh, destruction is going to happen <laughs> okay uh, I will read to you the transgressions of Judah uh, because the uh, Judeans are Hebrew I will not turn away this punishment because they have despised the law of the Lord. They have not kept his commandments. Their lies lead them astray, lies which their fathers followed. Okay, but I will send fire upon Judah and I will devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And for Israel, I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver, the poor for a pair of sandals. They plant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor. They pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl. They defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. And drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Wow, those are some pretty serious sins there. I was kind of comparatively unimpressed with the sins of Judah. But sin is sin. And with everything else going on, God had had it uh, with the human race at this point. He would promised not to send another flood and destroy the earth again. But... Uh, here are his own people uh, doing all these uh, wicked things, and uh, it's time for punishment. But here's what happens. Um, 
I think I'll start in verse 5 instead of 7. The Lord God of hosts, who has touches the earth, it melts, and all who dwell there mourn. All of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me? O children of Israel, says the Lord, did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Kerr? Uh, I saw a video, it popped up on my feed the other day, about someone was driving from Damascus to Kerr. Um, so he delivered the Syrians from Kerr, and I don't know the history behind that, but the uh, Philistines or Palestines, Palestinians, the original Palestinians, the natives were from Kephor, uh, C-A-P-H-T-O-R, and I've seen it spelled various ways. But the theory is that, that they were Grecian. They were from Crete. Uh, they had escaped from Crete. So they were, I guess, technically European. Um, and who came in, um, congealed with the natives of uh, pre-Cadenite society. But... I, I want to do a video on that later. I, I don't know how. It's very in-depth, and there's so many different theories that I don't know if I can explain it really well. But uh, I have been running across remnants of, you know, who are the Palestinians, the real Palestinians, the original Palestinians. So, anyway, where were they from, the, the Philistines? So, anyway, let's move on to verse 8. Behold... The eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For surely I will command that and will sit in the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is sifted from the sleeve. And not the smaller grain shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who says the Lord. Calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. On the day I will rise up the tabernacle of David, which was has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will rise up its ruin and rebuild it as the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does not, who does this thing. Uh, the Gentiles who are called by my name, that doesn't happen until after Jesus Christ walks on earth. The Gentiles are not called until the Holy Spirit descended after Jesus Christ ascended heaven. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seeds. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow with, with it. I will bring back the captives of my people of Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. And shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up. From the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now, the Babylonians came in and took captives. 
And that is in the past. Amos is, yeah, it's at the end of the Old Testament. So this timeline is after Babylonia. So I think either this is the scattering from the Assyrians or this is the scattering from that was restored in 1948 could be either one but it could be 1948 because um it's definitely no the gentiles are involved are part of god's uh part of the body of christ of course it doesn't say body of christ in the old testament uh but with the gentiles who call my name that would have to be after the time of Christ. And no other time from the time of Christ until 1948 were, was Israel restored. After uh, the um, temple was destroyed um, and it was either in 70 AD or 73 AD. But, you know, He's saying he's going to restore Israel and Judah. Now, the beginning of the chapter, the nations I listed. Uh, we, we know who what Damascus is. It has survived. We know what Gaza is. But Amorites and Moabites and Edomites... Who knows who they are today? I mean, out in the general populace. Uh, common knowledge by um, general society. Unless you live in the Middle East and have studied your genealogy <laughs> uh, and your heritage, uh, ty people typically do not know um, these nations because they don't exist anymore. Uh, Damascus... And Gaza are remembered. And Judah and Israel are remembered. Of course, we know that the Judeans, even though uh, they don't, their countries reunited with Israel. So those two divisions that had happened historically in the past have been restored as one. So the Judeans are Israeli. Uh, they're Hebrews. They're from the house of David. And that's another thing that just leaped out at me when I read this. The tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. Now, David built a tabernacle. Moses built a tabernacle. Moses and Aaron, <clears throat> in the desert, they designed, they were told, they were directed by God, how to build the tabernacle. And then David built a tabernacle in a permanent location. I don't know where that location is or right off the top of my head right now. But then Solomon built the temple. So there was a tabernacle in the desert, a temple after there was a kingdom, or, or tabernacle after there was a kingdom by David, and then his son, Solomon, built the temple. Herod rebuilt the temple, and it was destroyed in 70 or 73 A.D. Then, today, we have all this discussion about rebuilding the temple, and we've had all this discussion, if you haven't heard, about red heifers, the uh, Israeli government has obtained red heifers that need the red heifers. Oh, wow. What a rabbit hole I went down there. Uh, the red heifers are needed to purify priests that do all of the offerings in the tabernacle or the temple. So they've obtained red heifers. And we're talking... Uh, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, right now, 
the government of Israel has red heifers to sacrifice. But in order to sacrifice them, they needed the temple. Well, about a month ago, I was following the red heifers pretty intensely. And at Shiloh, which is northwest of Jerusalem, they have built another tabernacle. And that's what happened at the tabernacle of David. David built a tabernacle, and then his son built the temple. So they are talking about and want to rebuild the temple, but they can't because it's on the temple mount where the Dome of the Rock is. And that would be irksome to over a billion people who are Muslim. So, but they have rebuilt the tabernacle outside of Jerusalem. So they can sacrifice the red heifers there. They also have an altar at the Mount of Olives that they could sacrifice red heifers at. So they are progressing forward to restoring the temple, but they have restored the tabernacle. And I haven't seen pictures of it. It was They were talking about it at this conference about the red heifers. Um, in this uh, place called Silo uh, about a month ago. And this is, well, this is airing on the date that I'm reading this scripture. So uh, I'm very interested in what they're doing. Now, as a Christian, I look at all this as, you know, fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, I also look at this as um, ushering in the end days. I don't want the end days rushed in during my lifetime. I do not uh, want to see all the predicted uh, pain and death from Revelation. And I don't know why others would help in bringing on all of these uh, things from Revelations, which are a uh, revelation. which are horrible. Um, the prediction of the Euphrates River drying up, for instance, is what happens is that there's supposed to be four angels trapped under the Euphrates River that come out and destroyed two-thirds of the population and I don't know if that's of the entire earth or oh my goodness I didn't realize I had cookies over there <laughs> this is not my breakfast two-thirds of the population uh oh and they're coconut no are they coconut no they're sugar cookies I don't know why I saw coconut. I love coconut. I'm not eating those. I'm going to take those to church for people to eat. Um, but anyway, I don't know why people would want to bring that on. Um, but, you know, it's still happening. And But I don't know why Christians would want to help bring that on. I'm, I'm not going to oppose Israel on anything that they want to do. It's their country. It's their culture. It's their God same God we worship. And um, so I would not be for interfering with them, but I don't know that I would help them bring um, down or support anything that would bring prophecy to come true. I think we need to be very careful about that because the end days are very destructive. I want to live a long, peaceful life. I don't want to ground troops in America. I don't want, um, I don't want the war to be going on. But part of the reason Hamas started the war was because of the red heifers. Because all of the Muslims, Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, and all the other terrorist organizations, 
uh, that are funded by Iran are upset about the red heifers because the red heifers mean that they that Israel might want to procure the Dome of the Rock, which is a sacred site to them. They don't even want any Jew or really any Christian at the Dome of the Rock on the grounds. There is the Western Wall over here that the um, Jews come to to pray and to stuff prayers in that wall. And then the top area where the Dome of the Rock is, they don't want any Jews or, or Christians up there. And, um, and they are very sensitive about anything that happens that indicates that they're the, the Jews, Israel is going to rebuild the temple because that's their holy site. So them bringing in perfect red heifers to sacrifice in the temple uh, is, you know, it's called war to the Muslims, all of them, because they're not going to sacrifice the Dome of the Rock so the Jews can have their temple. But I think that um, I haven't seen the tabernacle or the footage or of the tabernacle. I just heard at this conference they had rebuilt a tabernacle um, northwest of Jerusalem. And if they've done that, that will alleviate some of the religious tension uh, between the two uh, factions. So I'm hoping that that's true, what they said at that conference. Uh, that would be wonderful. I would love to see a film uh, of the tabernacle that's being built because that could bring about uh, so much. It could calm things down, hopefully. Of course, now that they're in a war and this, you know, the October 7th attacks ha happen and retaliation from that and the Hezbollah activity, you know, uh, even though the red heifer situation might be relieved uh, by the tabernacle, uh, there is now an ongoing war uh, where there's been action, counteraction, counteraction, action. Uh, scenarios going on so um, I don't think the tabernacle will stop the war and it will have to be something else but uh, I I'm glad that they're rebuilding the tabernacle of course you know build, rebuilding the tabernacle just like David had a tabernacle built then his son built the temple so I guess it is another step Towards the temple, uh, but um, I'm I'm kind of happy that they have a tabernacle now and uh, or are working on it. I can't wait to see it, and um, I want to study the tabernacle and all its spiritual meanings in uh, my Torah lessons uh, when I get to that portion. Moses, right now in my uh, lessons, is. And Aaron are building the Levitical law. And Moses has gone up on Mount Sinai and gotten the Ten Commandments. I'll be reading more about that uh, for the evening study. I kind of got off track here uh, in Amos. I just, um, the more I know, the more I've studied, I can't not say who the Edomites are. <laughs> You know, they're from Esau, and I've read all about Esau and Jacob and their conflict in uh, Genesis and um, how the Israeli nation, the Hebrews, uh, the Jews had their beginning, and I just find it very fascinating. But the story of Amos is a story, a prophecy of how Israel comes back together and have, has their redemption, um, and they are not destroyed. They are brought together, and they have wine and honey. Uh, you know, the promised land, the land of milk and honey. Evidently, there's a lot of wine there, too. And uh, I, from what I've heard, 
the Israeli nation has profited a huge amount and they have cultivated their land and you know when they're not at war when they're at peace it's a beautiful wonderful place and I'd really like to go there someday I wouldn't go there today or next week um, but if there's ever a peace there of course from what people say from what I've heard, when there's peace there, I'll probably have been raptured by then. So I guess I'll never get to go to Israel, uh, to the Holy Land, or to Jerusalem. I mean, from what I understand, Tel Aviv is a tremendously wonderful city. Um, but um, who knows? Wilder things have happened. But I, I wouldn't risk my life to go uh, as things are currently and um, I hope you all have enjoyed my reading of Amos and uh, my thoughts about what the scripture means and uh, my views about the red heifers <laughs> you all have a wonderful and blessed day